I'm delighted to introduce um, Una Daly and Jenny Heyman, um, who are talking about something that I've seen as a thread right through the day, which is who are we missing closed open communities over to you two. Thank you very much, Francis. Good afternoon, everyone. I know this is, you know, really powering through the last part of the day, so we very much appreciate your attendance uh, and your attention to us. And I know we also have virtual participants who are watching online, so hello and welcome to you. Uh, Kate's um, idea this morning that we should make sure that we honor virtual participants is, I think, really important. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> so my name is Jenny Heyman. Uh, I have a brand new job, um, just finished my doctoral degree as part of the GoGN network, and I have a new job as Chair of Teaching and Learning at Cambrian College in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Uh, you can look at a map on that. It's pretty, about five hours north of Toronto, if you've ever been to Toronto. <laughs> so I'm in a new winter place, but it's also a real opportunity for me to think really carefully and really critically about how I create and um, invite people into my community. So that's kind of the thing that I've been thinking about in my role, and I'll let Una introduce herself as well. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I'm Una Daly. I'm the director of the Community College Consortium for OER, and we're part of the Global Open Ed Consortium. But I work primarily with the two-year public colleges in the United States. Um, and we have members in 38 states. So. Uh, uh, each institution looks a little different in the way that it implements open education. Um, and uh, Jenny and I talked about doing this presentation, and we talked about who uh, maybe we aren't attracting in our communities. Um, and certainly in my case, one really obvious thing is um, kind of a regional thing, and which is that uh, if you look at uh, I don't have a map here, but a lot of the work is being done bi-coastally, and there's less being done regionally uh, in the middle. Uh, more of that's happening now, which is really exciting, um, but it's an opportunity for us to look at uh, not only that particular one, but other ones, uh, other um, communities that we might, might not be thinking about. And let me see, I my little notes here. So one of the core values of the open community is, um, is access. And so um, Jenny and I felt that, you know, there's a lot of ways for us to be more open and look at um, who we're attracting into our communities. And I was at a presentation earlier this morning, I think, I think it was Lorna Campbell, who said, listening to the silence. And I thought that was a really um, insightful way to put it, those silences that are occurring, uh, who is not coming to the table? And, are there things we can do to support those other voices? Um, Thanks, Suda. Um, and so one of the, we we had great meetings, and again, it was a very transitional time in my life. But um, I've in the past year or two, a lot of presentations at open conferences have talked about inclusion. Particularly, Jess Mitchell talks about inclusion in a great way. Um, Robin DeRosa has been talking about it, and I've heard so much about it today, and what I'm starting to hear today is a very pragmatic approach to inclusion. Okay, great, it's a, it's a wonderful abstract concept, um, but how, as human beings, do we start to become more inclusive? What does that mean? So that's really what got us kind of going in our conversation and our partnership. So this is one of my favorite slides from Jess, Miller, uh, uh, Jess Mitchell in her talks. Um, she says, diversity is a number, inclusion is a process, and that's where I want to live for the next 25 minutes or so, uh, and equity is an outcome. So I really kind of like this concept around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and where inclusion is a process, uh, for me as a very pragmatic practitioner, that's kind of where I want to live. Um, so both Una and I kind of reflected quite a bit on uh, what is our inclusive process? If inclusion is a process, what does a process start to look like uh, in terms of inclusion? Um, and some of the places that I, you know, in, I went in my thinking um, was that uh, in at Cambrian College, I have a small working group. I have an instructional designer, an instructional developer, and a librarian, and a few faculty members who are interested in open as a practice and as a concept um, to help me share. And this is an institution with. 5,000 full-time students and uh, almost 1,000 faculty full-time and part-time. So that's a very small group. Um, I would like to expand that group. 
Uh, and so, but what can I do uh, to expand past those who are quite very interested in it to attract and support those who might be also interested in it and a variety of stakeholders? So I kind of got onto this idea to do doing and done. I'd love to be done, um, but what we want to talk with you today is more about the doing, how to. And, um, so I think first, you know, the first step is asking the question um, of uh, who, who in our community, who is outside of our community that uh, we really um, want to bring in. And um, I think we need to look at different outreach mechanisms for that. And um, we may have to go to those communities and find out. We may have to start with um, interviewing people in those communities and finding out what, uh, what resonates with them. I mean, there may be existing strategies that we're just ignoring. Um, one area that I'm very interested in is getting more of the workforce people involved in OER at the community colleges. That's kind of one of our three major thrusts at community colleges is workforce, first two years of university, and then remedial ed. So we really should have them more actively involved in OER. Um, great. And one of the questions I asked myself was, um, within this small community, am I the architect of it? Am I the builder? Am I the one who's driving all the things that are happening? Uh, and um, yes is the answer. And my sense is that is that is very true of many in this community. I'm, you know, I'm kind of the person who's um, not only driving things, but then also making all the rules about how things work uh, without uh, unintentionally choosing communication channels, choosing who is invited and who I speak with. Um, so just kind of thinking through, uh, for myself, am I the architect of my community? But I, you know, I invite you to reflect for a moment, um, are you the architect? And think specifically of one community. I know we're all members of many communities, um, but kind of the one that matters to you most, to the one that is mostly in your everyday work. Just think through, are you, are you the builder? Should you be sharing power somehow if you are the the real driver, uh, and what would your community start to look like if you started to share that power? Um, so when we talk about inclusion as a process, uh, I'm an instructional designer by, by trade, although I'm now many different things, uh, administrator for the first time in my life. Um, when I think of community inclusion, I think, is there a design process that I can think through? Can, is there, again, it's this very pragmatic hat I like to put on. Uh, and I really love this inclusive design um, definition from Jess Mitchell and her uh, Inclusive Design Research Center in Toronto, Ontario. She does some really amazing work uh, in terms of accessibility, disability, and inclusion. So if you can just read through that one, I think that might help drive some of the little tasks that we're going to ask you to do. And again, really pragmatic. Um, I would love for you to have worked through a little concept map, think through through your own communities, and the ways that you might be more personally inclusive of others, um, and fill out a map and share it with us by Twitter if you're interested in doing that. But we'll give you a couple of examples uh, of things that we've worked on as well. You're welcome to draw a concept map or ideas in your notebook. You don't have to use our worksheet. So I'm going to skip over Una's map and come back to it. So I'll talk about my map for a moment because Una is very generously handing out things. <laughs> So again, um, this concept of me at the center, right? I don't always want to be at the center. I actually would prefer that others come and be at the center um, uh, so that I can do other things and empower and support them as they do things that interest them. Um, but in my case at Cambrian College, again, I have this small nugget working group, uh, but there are so many other stakeholders at Cambrian College that could be involved if they were interested in that. It's always an invitation, right? Uh, but students are a particular uh, pain point for me. Uh, I'm new at the institution. I actually don't teach right now, and so I don't have a lot of access to the students. Um, I shouldn't be sending them emails. They're not my students. <laughs> I can talk with student government, but our student government at Cambrian College uh, is very new to open as well. It's a very new, brand new concept to them. They don't fully understand um, possibly the importance of it for them, or maybe it isn't important to them. Maybe mental health issues are more important to them, and so on. Um, we had an opportunity in Open Education Week this past year. We, we hosted a variety of events and had an opportunity to talk with academic advisors and student tutors and staff tutors who had never really heard of Open either. So that was a really great um, strategic plan 
for talking about openness at my institution. And it was kind of born of this conversation that Una and I were having, how can we be more inclusive? HR is also an interesting, so human resources, our support staff, who are not really treated as academics, uh, are also very unaware of open educational resources, but very interested in them for their own personal learning. Oop, I'm going to go back to your map. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so my professional looking map up there, and I think it's kind of fun because um, um, Jenny took very much of a functional approach, um, which is institutional based, and I'm at a nonprofit um, consortium. And so um, I looked at it more as kind of this circle of influence. And so in the middle is, is kind of our very small staff. And we have an executive council, which is uh, pretty much volunteer, but it's a small group, five or six people who help me uh, with the running and planning of the consortium. Um, primarily, they volunteer. And I very gladly accept their um, assistance with that. Well, we do a lot of other uh, surveys and so forth and outreach to members. but. Um, that the executive council is kind of the decision maker. Then we have our members in, within the consortium. And I normally would divide this up between active and not so active members. Um, a lot of the outreach week activities that we do feature our members because they are practitioners, experts in this field, and they share with others. And then we have the bigger community who participate in all of these events. We make almost all of our events available to any educator um, who is in, um, who's interested in open ed but they're not members in the sense that they're not surveyed at the end of the year. They also don't pay membership fees, which are relatively small. And then we also like to embrace the entire open ed community. So um, just a kind of a different approach to looking at who your community is. Boop. So as you, if you have a worksheet and you want to work on your worksheet, work in your notebook. For those who are virtual, um, I had tweeted out, and if you're on Twitter, um, links, the same link that's above um, to the worksheets, just to kind of get a, frames, a frame of space. But considering these, these questions as you start to kind of draw your map, um, who is in your community? Um, and what do you mean by in? It's always an interesting concept to me. Who's in, who's out? What do you mean by in? So if you can think on that. And it's meant to be a group activity, particularly if I mean, it might be a great opportunity to meet the person next to you, although, uh -huh. although people are pretty spread out. Yeah. Did, were there any people who didn't get the paper and would like it? Okay. Okay, so we have two. Okay. Um, and would you mind sharing with them if you're sitting next to somebody who has one? Thanks great. so much. Thanks. Um, so who is uninvited, excluded, and not in, not considered, and that can be intentional or unintentional? Usually it's unintentional, so it's just giving more reflection and more intention to your practice. Um, and then what actions might you take to start to reduce who's excluded uh, or who, is, who, is, who feels more invited or whom you who you think might, be, might benefit from this? They might not agree with you, and that's always a great conversation. Open's not really for me. I have that conversation a lot with faculty members, I can tell you. Um, but also with students, because they don't, you know, they're not fully aware of it or, or reversed in it. So just think about those questions, and I'm going to come back to them. Uh, and on the flip side is also a series of uh, a kind of worksheet to work through. Uh, if you have a community, if you're the architect or a member of a community that has a pretty strong central practice, what kinds of things do you do? Uh, and how do you communicate with each other? How do you communicate with external stakeholders or external people to the community? Uh, and what might you do to change that um, inclusion? So I'm going to leave this one up while you work. Uh, and we're going to come back just with five minutes to go. So not a lot of time for questions. But again, um, it would be really valuable for us, if you were interested to do so, to take a picture of your map. Um, and to just tweet out a little bit or use whatever social media you like to talk a little bit about your thoughts. Uh, about this very pragmatic approach to inclusion. Pull your attention back this way, if we can, for the last few minutes. And um, we'd like to hear if anyone would like to share insights. Just raise your hand, and um, Jenny is going to, oh, and we have a young man here who's uh, going to take gonna, I'm going to take that generous offer. <laughs> All right, we saw a lot of engaged conversation. Maybe you were talking about your plans for the evening. <laughs> Never. Okay. No problem. Uh, all right.
<laughs> no, it's a real community building. Over to you, Louise. Um, no, not really. But we, we had a very interesting d discussion about how we feel about being an architect of a community and actually in our own kind of notions of how we participate in communities as well. And maybe we feel maybe more part of a community or on the periphery. But I'm going to hand over to Louise because she was far more eloquent than I was. <laughs> Um, well, well, first of all, I think one of the things we discussed about the diagram was the idea that, um, well, for, for, the, for a start, I don't feel like I'm the centre of any diagram, really, um, and I'm quite happy floating along the periphery, but, uh, but also that the circles were satellite groups and then individuals, and um, as an experiment, we tried putting in actually a network at the centre, which is the FEMED Tech Network plug. Plug. Um, but you know, we, we were looking at that and thinking about then as ourselves, the next step out from that were actually individuals. And then within that, the individuals bring their networks with them. So it's it's that kind of that kind of intersection. And um, then in relation to what I could have paraphrased what you were saying, Sheila, about what you were talking about, that your your work involves creating spaces and and getting back to that idea of the architect, that that actually instead of the architect building the, the structure, it's, it's the space around the structure or within the structure that actually we're, we're facilitating those spaces to happen for other people to be in rather than to be some sort of determinator of, of, of what's happening in the space or, or indeed the shape of the space itself. Great, thanks very much. That's a really good conversation. Um, but it does bring to mind, because a friend asked me, um, I had the FEMED tech stickers, and he's a man, and he said, am I allowed to have a FEMED tech sticker? So that's kind of an interesting idea of, of how do, do people feel in that community um, that they can be part of. I said, of course, that was my first answer. <laughs> so hopefully that's the right answer. Does anyone else have a, kind of an observation about their conversation? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh, no, Francis, she, uh, she's doing her five minutes. Well, <laughs> that means you have to speak, though, because you raised your hand. <laughs> okay, thanks, Francis. There is no requirement to, to share or to have a comment, but if you're interested in, in thinking through it, reflecting more, and, and filling things in and sharing it out with Twitter, we'd love to see how thoughts are going on this front. Um, we can end a bit early, and again, just because I, I put a lot of work into my slide and I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jenny did a super job on the slides. I honestly am never, you know, the kind of person that says that kind of thing. Um, so what we're, are the invitation, the takeaway is to make space and that's, I really love that concept now of making space um, in all kinds of ways. Extend in invitations, open up your practices, um, so that more people feel welcomed, valued, involved, and empowered as part of, um, or leaders of, your communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.